Good evening all. I'm Tab Binding and I'm our program manager for the Riverside Sunderland University Design Challenge, which is brought to you by TRADA, the Timber Trade Federation, MOBI and Sunderland City Council. This week is week three and we're talking about materials and carbon emissions. And tonight we're talking about health and well-being. This webinar series runs alongside um, the Student Challenge, which is um, based up in Sunderland. Um, and this is the site. We're asking you to design one home in detail and an indicative master plan for 100 homes. So I'd like to hand over to Simon Corby, um, Director of the Alliance for Sustainable Build Building Products, who is our chair for this evening. Thank you, Tabitha. So good evening, everybody. My name is Simon Corby. Uh, I'm a general practice charter surveyor and um, director of the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. So one of the sponsors for this event. So thanks to Tabitha for the invitation. So uh, we're a not-for-profit uh, organization. We're mission-led, and that's our mission, to accelerate the transformation to a healthy, low-carbon built environment. So um, we ask our members to sign up to our mission, and we have these work themes here, health and well-being, resource efficiency, whole life carbon, ethics and transparency, technical performance, and social value. And of course, the, what we need to do is remember all of these things need to work together. So they're not uh, in silos, but um, so health and well-being is very much a part of resource efficiency and technical performance. So it's how these, um, all these subjects work together. So um, these are our members and um, we've got sort of very large from the likes of Vinneberger um, to the very small um, to the 100 year old company to the innovators like Biome, who are making mycelium insulation. We've been very busy. These are the subjects that we've been uh, offering training on. All of these um, resources are up on our website, so you can have a trawl there through. Uh, we are a knowledge sharing organization, so we aim to um, just sort of speed up the transformation. And next week, uh, we have our Healthy Buildings Conference. This is our fifth one. This is looking um, at healthy places, really, and the sort of interface between external and internal air and how one affects the other. And we've got some really fantastic speakers. Um, and because I'm a generous minded soul, um, I'm going to suggest that you guys can uh, book on as our guest uh, for no charge. So um, you're just going to have to drop me a note to say you're interested. So a really in, a great lineup of speakers. Um, and then in the afternoon of the Wednesday, we've got our Dragon's Den Innovation Pitch Series Final. So all these guys have won previous events. So the idea is to look at products that use less plastic in construction. Um, and then on the Thursday, we have our awards. Um, so this is sponsored by TTF and uh, amongst others. And it's about sort of lockdown epiphanies. Um, so they're both free events. They should be quite a lot of fun. Um, so I'd urge you to sign up to them. They should be fun and interesting at the same time. So that's me done. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, so I'm now going to hand you over to Paula McMahon. So Paula is Northeast Vice Chair and Teesside Chair for the Institution of Civil Engineers. And Paula is going to offer some sort of local context for us. Um, so over to you, Paula. Thank you, Simon. So um, to just tell you a little bit about myself, I've had 30 years in civil engineering, in uh, design and construction. And um, the Institution of Civil Engineers are obviously um, to do with civil engineering. But for those that don't know, basically civil engineers deal with everything to do with the built environment and infrastructure in particular. 
Um, so what do we do locally in the northeast? Well, in the northeast, we actually have the same issues as we do nationally and arguably globally, that sustainability is becoming more paramount in everything we do. This is actually contrary to the local context of that we've been asked by government and our local authorities to build thousands of new homes. So arguably that in itself isn't very sustainable. And given that the Institution of Civil Engineers and many other institutions have said we need to absolutely work towards carbon neutrality as soon as possible. Um, we obviously need to, to think of what we can do and utilising more sustainable materials is obviously one of the things we can do as a substitution. So one of the things that is, this project is about and it's bringing to the fore is the need to work together and to collaborate as a whole design team. That interdiscipline working is definitely something that happens on the ground in real life and also happens within the institutions and other organisations. And that's one way to consider true sustainability. Um, understanding all the aspects of, of a build, of a design, and then considering that construction cost and the cost to run, but not just in terms of monetary value, but actual um, value uh, to the environment, value to the people, the well-being of the people, and obviously what the cost is to the environment and the people by not doing things in a good way. So locally, the Institution of Civil Engineers are collaborating with universities and other institutions. And one such institution is another thing that I chair, which is Engineering Together in the Tees Valley. And that's many institutions looking to uh, educate uh, the public about engineering, um, trying to get young people in to, to study STEM subjects and work together for, on this sort of climate agenda. So the Institution of Civil Engineers is totally and utterly accepted that education is key to um, this sustainability goal. And we acknowledge that, that not all of our members have that timber um, understanding. Um, we, we don't use it very much or we haven't in recent years. And so few have an understanding of the consequences of um, not having the correct detailing, having the wrong moisture content um, and not choosing the right timber for the right location. So this sort of project is helpful for everybody to, to start to piece together that, that puzzle. So something we all need to look at is taking that opportunity to educate ourselves uh, and educate others like we're doing as part of this um, series of talks. But another thing that people don't realise is we need to start speaking to politicians because strategic changes are needed to accelerate the change so we can all choose to do things and choose to um, change materials for more sustainable ones but actually if we had building regulations that required certain limits and changes and thinking then that would actually make people um, to do that change and engineers architects and other people in the future will actually accelerate the where we need to be to net zero but in the meantime every one of us can do research and consider what we can actually do ourselves and uh, I wanted to mention that a speaker who's an ICE member, who's a, a local um, engineer in the Northeast, actually did a project a few years ago called Green Beams. Beam being as in the structural member beam. So there's a website for that, which is www.greenbeams.com. And that explores some of the practicalities and engineering issues associated with timber, such as drying out and where you would put um, cuts to, to lessen the stresses on uh, different types of timber. So remember that these events and taking, partaking in competitions will count towards your future professional development. So as a, as a key, uh, a very keen person that's interested in getting people professionally qualified for the Institution of Civil Engineers, just remember to make, keep a log of all of the good stuff that you're doing in this project, and then it'll be good for your future CV and your future professional development. So one of the things that you'll learn when you're doing this project and other things at uni is that getting the concept in from the beginning actually means that it'll it'll come out the end. So that's something that as, as practicing engineers in, uh, we all need to do now and in the future. And that collaboration making all of us stronger will actually help utilize everybody's sort of learnings. And then the more we 
understand and the more we know that we'll be able to properly balance those risks, opportunities and, and costs and values. So this local project in Sunderland has the potential to show other universities and organisations how to work together for a better sustainable future. So myself and the Institution of Civil Engineers are keen to watch what you're doing at Sunderland and this inspirational programme is certainly something that we're, um, we're very interested in. So best of luck with it. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Excellent. So thank you so much for that local context and words of encouragement there. So thank you. So I'm going to hand over now to our next speaker, who's uh, Dr. Ed Sutty, uh, who works, uh, he's a director at the BRE, the Building Research Establishment, uh, based in Watford. And you'll see that, um, um, yeah, so over to you, Ed, thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and I, I'd support those words. I'm really delighted to be supporting this really creative and thought-provoking program, and, and particularly those of you that are considering entering the design competition against the imperatives of net zero. So I'm going to talk to you today a bit about using timber in the home for health and well-being. So I work at BRE. We're 100 years old this year. Um, multidisciplinary organization working across the built environment, probably most famous for our BRIAM whole building assessment methodology. But many of my colleagues and I get really stuck into quite thorny problems around the built environment. My own background, I've had 25 years working in the forest products sector, and I've been very fortunate to interface in a number of ways in this really interesting world around health and well-being and the role that materials and particularly wood uh, can play in that through various programs looking at internal comfort in buildings, reviewing data and evidence that exists uh, internationally to support the specification of wood and also leading a large office refurbishment program around biophilic office design which is the deployment of um, nature and near nature analogues into our built environment to create a more human centered environment. So yeah, why now? Of course, um, buildings, of course, are still being designed and homes are still being put up today that will exacerbate issues around seasonal affective disorder, depression, breathing difficulties, not to mention the, the carbon and retrofit challenge. WHO is flagged up that uh, stress is the primary cause of sickness in office workers. That's overtaken any other muscular skeletal issues that were the, the sort of front runner, certainly in the earlier part of this century. And stress is one of those key things that's taking people out of work due to ill health. And a lot of that's to do with working environment and the buildings they're in. Lots of different things at play here. So obviously we've urbanized a lot in the last 50 plus years. You can see in Europe, 74% of the population now live in urban environments, compared with roughly a half. We've got larger and increasing numbers of households that are single person occupancy, over age 65 and over. And the reality is that we're spending most of our lives indoors, of course, and, and particularly under our most recent year of, of lockdown. And one of the resulting um, effects of that is we have lost our connection to nature. And if I was doing this presentation in front of an audience, I'd normally get them to think about a place where you might feel relaxed and inspired and then invite people to suggest what they've come up with. And nine times out of 10, people are talking about sort of warm, comfortable environments, often in nature, people think about being in mountains or woodlands or rivers. So there's a really strong connection between ourselves and how we perform and what's around us. This is borne out by a number of things. This is Shirin Yoku, which is a prescribed by GPs in Japan for certain mental health disorders and recovery from various illnesses. This effectively is prescribing people to take walks in nature. It has healing properties. I'm really delighted to say when I first started talking about this, nobody in the UK was doing this. It's now being prescribed from Dundee to, to Mid Wales. So there is real recognition about the benefits of outdoor exercise, but also that immersion in nature. So, okay, well, what about buildings then? So if we think about 
the biophilia hypothesis that humans possess an innate tendency to seek connection with nature. We are part of nature. We have this genetic connection to it. A Harvard professor of biology, Wilson, popularized this in, in 1984. And it translates into those three key things around connection with nature in buildings, natural analogs, and our human spatial response. And you can see natural analogs is already giving a, a strong tip towards the use of wood materials in interiors. If we think about what defines a great indoor environment, we'd almost certainly agree in our conversation about qualities about lighting, daylight, artificial, color, temperature, air quality, acoustic performance. There is some quite interesting subtlety, of course, because we're all individual and we will have slightly different responses in different environments. But broadly, somewhere in amongst all those things is a sweet spot around a great indoor environment. If we think about building occupant health and well-being, the building environment has lots of things at play there. Wood as a material has potential to offer lots of things at play in terms of indirect contact with nature through biophilic design, visual variety, color, aesthetic. This interesting quality around hydrothermal mass. It can act as a buffer for humidity in the air in the space, and that also influences temperature buffering as well. And then around the occupant, this control and comfort levels. So we're going to see a little bit more about these in a, a couple of minutes. But in essence, it's quite a complex mixture of things at play here. So I'm a scientist. I like to look at the science and the evidence. And this is a very sort of quick whiz through some of it. So if we think about people who have a positive attitude towards wood and interiors, and it's commonly perceived and preferred over other materials, this absolutely stacks of evidence for this. Whether it's around the difference between a solid piece of wood or a reconstituted wood, and people always prefer the solid wood outcome, or whether it's differences between primary materials. The preference studies through consumers and professionals always are drawn to that natural solid wood material. In Australia, they did quite a, a major study looking at qualities of different materials. And you can see wood got the top score across those questions around natural feel, warm environments, visually appealing, environmentally friendly. The only one it missed out on was really cheap, which went hands down to plastic, which is perhaps no surprise. And even more intriguing in some ways is even when wood's in a room and people don't know it's there. So they are just responding to how it's impacting on the, on the indoor atmosphere both in terms of that buffering I was talking about, but also about the VOC release from that, that wood. So some volatile organic compounds are actually good. They're the same compounds that you smell as you walk through a pine forest in the, in the outdoors that you will get from the timber use itself. But overwhelmingly, the panelists signified preferences, statistically significant, for the wood walled room, even though they didn't know wood was there. So our first hypothesis is pretty resounding, yes, people have positive attitudes towards wood and interiors and they choose it in preference. Our second is wood has a positive impact on human psychology and physiology, the big kind of drivers for how we perform in our indoor environments. A really seminal piece of work was conducted by Ulrich about on patients recovering from gallbladder surgery those that recovered in rooms that had views over nature compared to those that recovered with views of a brick wall. So the patients recovered faster, 8.5% faster, requiring 22% less medication, felt less pain, and just thinking about the bed crisis, they all went home earlier. So again, there's some really intriguing qualities if we link our wood into biophilic design in the same way that a view from a window, a view of nature is, um, is linked here to provide an opportunity for creating some very positive impact. Another groundbreaking study in Austria, in the Hauptschulhaus in Enstal in Austria, looked at different classroom spaces. Uh, so one classroom was very timber rich uh, and others were, were quite sort of normal and, and low in use of timber. So the, the year long study found heart rate significantly decreased, decreased in the pupils in the rooms of the solid wood classrooms, 
perceived stress from interactions was decreased significantly. There's a whole range of really intriguing things coming out of these studies. They didn't find a significant difference or change over time in concentration. But the pointer is that if people feel calmer, less stressed, more relaxed, they're going to learn better and the educational outcomes will be better. So if we look at hypothesis two, so what has a positive impact on human psychology and physiology? Definitely evidence in education, healthcare and office. When we flip into homes, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, there are limited or little or no studies around evidencing for homes and housing, and often because of that aspect around personal choice, but certainly one where the data is starting to be gathered. Our final hypothesis, what is specified for its health and well-being qualities? If we sort of tour the world very briefly, absolutely it's being de deployed very heavily in healthcare environments, as you can see here in Canada, in housing and healthcare environments across in Australia. So it is starting to be utilized and they do reference these projects, the health qualities of the material. However, if you look at um, you know, all those other fantastic qualities, why you would specify timber and have timber in a, an interior environment, it's the aesthetic, it's carbon storage, it's versatility, strength to weight ratio, the list goes on and on. It's still quite rare to find a very specific reference to the health and well-being qualities, which is why I sometimes refer to it as a hidden quality of the material, but hidden things are waiting to be discovered. So our third and final hypothesis is absolutely it's being specified for all those great reasons, but in a very limited context at the moment, specifically connected to health and well-being. Although it is growing and gaining momentum through biophilic design and that bigger picture around connection to nature. So what can wood do to our indoor environment? So many things. So the aesthetic hydrothermal mass, this buffering capacity, it can reduce glare. It can dampen noise given the appropriate surface conditions where it could be perforated or textured. It can provide a particular odor into the environment that is very beneficial. And we've all probably experienced that going into a, a timber rich building. It also has, in some cases, antibacterial qualities. And part of the real interest around quantifying that buffering capacity is it even has potential to be energy saving in terms of that ability to modulate peaks and troughs in interior temperature. So the home and house design. So the, the sort of primary reason, so this sympathetic nervous system, which is the one that causes stress response, increased blood pressure, et cetera. When we're in nature, this SNS activation is, is significantly lowered. So that's when we're on our walk that's prescribed by our GP. However, we're stuck in our buildings for, for most of our lives and indeed in our homes for a very large part of that, that duration as well. And you balance that against the fact that 90% of people want a home that doesn't compromise their health and well-being. That's a, a bit of a no-brainer, I think. And a third of those people would pay more for something that was a healthy home. And then align that with the fact that wood products provide this indirect connection to nature and can unlock health and well-being benefits for occupants. There's a real opportunity, I think, here to, to add value to our specification of wood. So my final, final slide and final thought is to think about those of you that are at this design stage. So as designers, the power is really all yours about shape, form, function of spaces, materials, specifications, uh, and light. And just reflect on your sort of personal self, all those qualities that you have experienced and in buildings that you've been into. And just think back about where timber was playing a role in that, whether it was to do with the acoustics or the haptic, the surface qualities, or the aesthetic, or that connection to nature. So I really applaud as I say, this, uh, this competition, this initiative, and uh, delighted to be supporting it. And I wish, wish luck to all those that are entering designs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed, for an excellent presentation. It'd be um, good to have a bit more time, some fascinating information there. Uh, if you've got any questions for Ed, um, please just pop them in the chat. And uh, Ed's going to keep an eye on that. and respond to those um, as we go along. 
I was so pleased to see the Dyson Neonatal uh, Centre mentioned in Ed's talk. It's my favourite building for, for timber and health and well-being. They've done some extra, uh, some excellent monitoring on, on newborn babies, measuring their heart rates. And um, so the neonatal centre sort of reduced the stresses and the heart rate within, uh, within newborn babies considerably, which meant they, they, they spent less time in the centre and visitors uh, stayed longer in the centre because it was so comfortable. So fantastic example. Um, so we've got some quite nice case studies up on our website uh, around domestic and, and commercial buildings for timber uh, as well. So hopefully there'll be some inspiration. There's quite a few CLT buildings and timber buildings there. So thanks ever so much, Ed. So please put some questions to Ed in the chat. I'm sure you've got some comments or questions there. And we're going to move on now to Jamie Liversedge, who's a landscape architect at the University of Gloucestershire. And Jamie is going to look at the sort of big picture. Um, so the master plan and, and the benefits that natural materials bring to the built environment. So, so over to you, Jamie, please. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. So uh, let me just uh, quickly share this and get it up and running. Look at that, we're bang on time, unbelievable. Okay, hopefully uh, you can see that screen. Let me just convert it into... You put it into full page, yep. Yep, full page. Screen mode, hopefully you, can still, hopefully you can still see that. It's coming, it's coming. There's yeah, a bit of a, is that okay? a bit of a delay as it travels down the motorway to uh, south, <laughs> south of the country. So I can, I don't know about anybody else, but I can just see a black screen at the moment. Okay. Is anybody else? Uh, yes, yeah, still. Okay, so let's, let's just go. Um... So just try that again, I think. It's just a case of, um, I don't know. Okay, just. So we can see that, I can see that clearly. Who am I? Okay, so maybe it's better that uh, we it's, can just stick with that one, maybe, get rid of everything else. Yeah, okay, I mean, we can certainly, it's certainly big enough to to see. Okay, just wait a minute. Okay, yeah. Um, so, um, yes, so, um, well, Again, thank you very much, both of you, and thank you, Ed, for um, really um, starting the process, really. Um, as the introduction is, um, I'm a landscape architect. Um, I have been for about 30 years, um, and I teach at the University of Greenwich. Um, I'm an academic, I'm an author, but um, more than anything, that I'm a collaborative designer. So as a landscape architect, I am a decision maker, a shape changer, a placemaker, an urbanist, an environmentalist. But my sole role often is a collaborative, um, a creative collaborator who often the landscape leads the design team on big master plans. And it's, it's just important to understand about that collaborative nature. The great thing about this competition and the great thing about working with um, other disciplines is you learn so much about, um, about the materials, you learn so much about uh, the, the concepts and the nature of things. Okay, so I collaborate with the site predominantly and the thing about landscape architects, of course, is that we, um, we're a blend of science and arts. You know, so we understand the scientific processes. We also have to understand the aesthetic processes of design. So we collaborate with architects, civil and structural engineers, planners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Probably the most important people we communicate with are the bottom two lines, which are politicians, de developers, contractors, adults, children, and the wider ecology. Probably on a project like this project, it's really important to understand about local context, to understand about the brief, to understand about 
how you develop the ideas needed to be successful in designing space and place for real people. And that's what this competition is very much about. I mean, collaborating in, in design teams is about that sharing of ideas. It's that nurturing of concepts. It's that um, exploring technical challenges. It's also about um, how you explore new technologies and new techniques. Okay, I mean, the other thing is that you need to understand what master planning is and what landscape is. And these days we often refer to the natural world. We often are driven by um, the politics of the natural world. We explore and make a lot of our life choices based on um, an ethical approach to the planet. And therefore, it's important to understand what natural, nat what natural materials are and how they contribute to our lives. So firstly, landscape. I'm a landscape architect. And realistically, everything under the sky is what, as a designer, I'm working with. It's the composition of the basic elements of water, vegetation, surface, changes in level and landform and built forms but it's also about creating place it's creating identity it's about creating uniqueness and it's about responding to context and the importance of context so the big thing is that there's a difference between the master plan and master planning okay a master plan tends to be a physical thing a report, a drawing, or whatever. Master planning as a process is a non-linear collaborative process, which uh, enables the designers to forget what their disciplines are, forget what their egos are, and to contribute to a much wider process. And within that process, it enables stakeholders, the public, the users, the developers, all of these people to collaborate but not also not only with the design team but the site and the future okay the process is about creative hypothesis it involves analysis and synthesis of the site and the brief so as students looking at this competition it's important that when you look at the master planning process and you think about how the organization of the site is going to work that you begin to understand that creativity is a big part of it, that you need to understand what the site gives to you and what you can give to the site, how you can create character, how you can create identity. The other thing, of course, is that you know, master plans are about looking forward. And often we tend to see um, development drawings as being how. Um, it's all going to be. The thing about being a landscape architect is that I know that once the project is finished, it's only just beginning. The landscape is just starting to develop. And therefore, I can make decisions now, which in 150 years' time will reach maturity. Okay. And they're decisions that are based on science, but also based on aesthetic processes. Okay, the other thing about master planning is that it's a technique that you learn by doing. And it's a technique that has to explore a, a range of options. It has to explore both convergent and divergent thinking and processes which enable you to, um, to share, to challenge and to synthesize. Okay, it's about this vision of the future. Part of that vision is about how things are managed, how things are maintained, but also the natural processes of, of birth, death, and um, erosion, degradation, all of these different things, okay? And it's, again, framing 
your proposals for the master plan, framing it in a way where you understand it's a creative, coherent whole will help you move this process forward. So like I said, master plans are a product of a master planning process and they can be, I want, I need, we could, what if, could be any of those different focuses. But basically they're setting up a framework for development. So in this case, you're looking at 100 buildings on two sites, which are divided by a road, uh, which sits on the edge of a riverside walk, which has this fantastic view. Okay, and therefore it's important again that you understand that the master plan is there to guide the site and the concept and to also to generate the parameters that you work within. It's a process. Okay, now what do they have to do? They have to functionally resolve the brief at a range of scales and the range of scales can be the wider landscape, the wider context, all the way down to detail and focus. So whether you use natural materials, whether you use timber, whether you use uh, local stone, whether you use recycled brick, all of these different things are about detail, but they're also about the wider context of the idea. Master plans look at design, they look at function, but more importantly, they look at the lived experience. You're, you're trying to create a sense of place. You're trying to create a place where people want to be, whether it's inside looking out or whether it's outside enjoying nature and connecting into the wider environment. So we often refer to these days as talking about a landscape led process. And certainly within the last 10 years of my professional life, um, the process has changed. For a long time, landscape architecture and landscape was very much at the back end of a development process. It was there to fill in the gaps between stuff, whether it was built form, whether it was urban design, whether it was uh, large scale planning. It was this thing often referred to as leftover space. Whereas now, certainly within the last 10 years, it's changed. People understand the value of it, the environment. They understand the value of character and they understand what living in design space is about. You know, so there are a series of key drivers which are quite important to, to really get clear when you're looking at master planning as a process. First of all, aspect and orientation. Thinking about the natural world thinking about the site and how it sits, the prevailing winds, the exposure to wind and rain and sunlight, the amount of shade given by either the built structures or the vegetation, the amount of sunshine that enlivens the spaces where people are gonna uh, enjoy, the beauty and the drama of the natural setting. This site is a fantastic site to explore all of these things. The other thing about aspect and orientation, of course, it's about views, it's about its context. Then there's the concept of green infrastructure networks. So these are multifunctional connective elements within the, within the site and within its wider context. They can be hedgerows, they can be trees, street trees, private gardens, public parks, the riverside, the riverside walk, all of these different things. They can be productive landscapes, they can be um, amenity landscapes, but the important thing about them is they are interconnected. They are part of a performance network. You know, they contribute to each other. You've got two minutes there, Jamie. Okay. The next is about spatial hierarchy and sequence. So placemaking, sense of place and serial vision. So one of the things about design is this thing about creating character, distinctiveness and harmony. Okay, quickly moving through. The big thing about this evening's talk, of course, is about health and well-being. And the thing about connecting landscape and, and the built environment and nature and the built environment is creating this room to breathe, 
to explore the natural context of the location, to create places to meet, gather, play, watch, engage. Whether it's about walking in the countryside, whether it's about bird watching, whether it's about running and kicking a football, all of these things are part of that designed space. The last thing is connectivity. To establish a clear, safe, sustainable linkages, uh, again, hugely important. And then to quickly run through these, Okay, if you think about that process and you think about the site, first of all, you look at the wider context, aspect, topography. You look at the visual linkages and the grain. Then you look at the green infrastructure networks, the ones that exist and the ones that are going to be proposed. And then you see how your master plan of the site connects into them. And then the last thing is to develop a distinctive spatial character, to think about the sense of place, to think about the architecture and how it goes together to create identity. The other thing is two useful guides that um, are worth one, which is recently being published, the National Design Guide, but also the um, Town and Country Planning um, design the master planning series garden city standards both of these are really good guides to guide you about placemaking about sense of place and master planning and that is it excellent thank you jamie fantastic presentation bang on time really interesting excellent. so um please put your questions uh, to any of the speakers um, to add to Jamie into the chat um, and so we'll ask them to keep an eye on that. Um, so I'm going to now hand over to uh, Dr Alessio Russo uh, who's a landscape architect uh, at the University of Gloucestershire and Alessio is going to look at external air quality and the influence of landscaping. I'm very much looking forward to, to this presentation so over to you Alessio. Thank you. Hello everyone. I would like first of all to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting me here today. Um, one second. Um, for those of you who don't know me already, my name is Alessio Russo. I'm the academic course leader for the Master in Landscape Architecture at the University of Gloucestershire. Let me start by saying just a few words about my background. I have a PhD in urban forestry, a master in landscape design and planning, and I'm conducting research in several countries on urban ecosystem services, smart and green cities, and sustainable landscape design. During the next 15 minutes, now 14, I'm going to be talking to you about air pollution and health problems, green infrastructure, and nature-based solution, Ecosystem services, in particular pollution removal and carbon storage sequestration by vegetation. And finally, I will show you several design tools such as i3 and the NVMet that maybe you can use for, your, for this competition. Um, as you can see here, the dramatic number of deaths due to air pollution in 2017 in this country, it estimates that long-term exposure to man-made air pollution has an, an annual effect equivalent to 28,000 to 36,000 deaths. The infographics on the infographic on this slide show the sources of uh, air pollution. Um, and the next slide show the health effect of air pollution. So we can have uh, short-term effects and long-term effects. So as you can see, stroke, lung cancer, so really bad. <laughs> um, the problem is that air pollution affect people throughout their lifetime. And uh, as a landscape architect, I'm thinking, how can we improve air quality? The answer is uh, simple is just designing green infrastructure. Nowadays, we are using this new term, nature-based solutions. 
And nature-based solution use ecosystem services um, and the services they provide to other societal challenges such, such as climate change, food security, or natural disaster. I would like to highlight that uh, ecosystem services are the benefits that uh, humans obtain from ecosystem. And the human health and well being depend on ecosystem goods and services. In addition, uh, sustainable communities are linked to ecosystem services and human health and well being. You can see here the ecosystem services provided by green and blue infrastructure. So as you can see, the number, the letter A is regulation of microclimate, noise reduction, food production, carbon storage and sequestration, habitat provision, runoff retention and water filtration, recreation, recreation cultural values, and air purification. So we can reduce air pollution at the city scale, you may, you may have heard about the forest cities to save China from air pollution. Uh, this is a project done by the Italian architect Stefano Boeri. And what is important is that vegetation can increase surface areas for deposition of pollutants in an area. So as you can see here, a 65 to 60 feet wide buffer may reduce pollutants by 40 to 75%. So the impact of, veg of vegetation such as trees, shrub, green walls on airflow and turbulence can influence the dispersal of pollutants across any area. In this part of my presentation, you can see flow and pollutant dispersion parted in a street canyon. Uh, the first one is without vegetation. The second one is with trees. The numbers, uh, the letter C is with shrubs. And the last one is with the green wall and green roof. What is important is that the street design and uh, species selection is very important for pollutants removal. According to several studies, pollutant, pollutants were trapped, as you can see here, at the street canyon with the, uh, with the uh, dense tree cover because there is no ventilation. So the trapping effect of air pollutants in the presence of vegetation may reduce the edge exchange between the inside and outside of the canyon, especially as you can see here, uh, below the canopy. This is, um, so this is a research, here is uh, the dispersion pattern of road pollutants under open road configuration without vegetation barrier, with the vegetation and with the green wall. This is uh, a research conducted by Professor Kumar and his team for evaluating green infrastructure effect on air quality in open road condition. They investigate the influence of roadside green infrastructure on concentration of particulate matters, PM10, PM2.5, black carbon, a particular number concentration under three different G green infrastructure condition, hedges only, trees only, and a mix of trees and hedges, shrubs. And as you can see here, there's a scenario at one meter and a scenario to two meter. Um, and here you can see the concentration uh, changes. Um, so ages and trees plus um, uh, 
um, reduce uh, reduce higher uh, PM 2.5 uh, reduction percentage reduction in concentration increase with increase in leaf area density. So if you would like to know more uh, about the design of vegetation barrier, this is an interesting article. So I have just you know, um, 15 minutes, but uh, um, I have also set ecosystem services in Cheltenham. This is a recent publication, as you can see here. PM concentration is lower in, uh, in areas with the higher vegetation cover. I have also quantified um, ecosystem services in particular um, pollution removal of different streetscape such um, uh, boulevards, parks, uh, uh, plaza. So here you can see annual total pollution removal by different streetscape. And um, the chart on, the, on this slide uh, show average pollution removal. Uh, I have also written several papers on, star on um, carbon storage by vegetation. So if you want to use my approach for this competition, please have a look at my publication. So this is a publication from 2017. And this is a recent publication on total urban carbon storage and waste, and, and waste managing, management emissions. Um, I'm now approaching um, the end of my presentation, and I would like to focus your attention on two, on two tools that you can use for your design. So the first tool is uh, i3. So we have different i3. We have um, i3 landscape, i3 canopy, i3 design, i3 eco. Uh, but I will talk in particular about I3 Canopy, um, which um, estimates tree cover and tree benefit of, for a given area with a random sampling process that let you easily classify ground cover types. It is an American tool, but you can use in this country, so you can go online and just click get started, as you can see here. Uh, so as I said, you can use in this country. You just need to select your uh, boundary, as you can see here. So also, as you can see now, this tool is also adapted to the UK. So you have US boundaries and you have UK boundaries. Um, so you select your boundary, uh, then uh, you click and I3 canopy randomly generate some sample points. So this is the boundary. And yes, remember that you need to include the United Kingdom, the currency. And then this is uh, uh, all the air pollution that the uh, tool is calculating. And these are the randomly uh, point that the tool is generating. So I don't know if you can see it's a small cross. And so this point, I, I said, this is a tree. And as you can see here, other point, this is a grass of bushes. Um, and then just this morning, I just, uh, just did uh, about how many, 11 points. And the, uh, this tool is calculating, as you can see the tree cover so the, the first one is grass. The second one is uh, buildings in previous other, in previous road, and then trees and shrubs, but also you can modify and water. Um, and then the, the tool is calculating the carbon monoxide removal annually, nitrogen dioxide removed annually, ozone removed annually, and uh, PM less than 2.5 and the one that are greater than 2.5. So it's a great tool, it's free, it's available online. 
And you've got then, one minute, Alessio. Yes. So the last um, tool is Envimet. Uh, this tool, unfortunately, is not for free, but it's a real tool that you can use for. It's a very good tool that you can use for your design. So this uh, uh, tool, you can calculate the air pollutant dispersion. So you can uh, calculate the emission transport of particle particles and gases, chemical reaction between uh, uh, NOx, ozone, and BVOX. Um, and I want to show you the simulation results of uh, this tool. And this uh, um, some example of uh, Street Canyon in, uh, in Italy. Also, we are using uh, other tools, more tools. So if you would like to know about these other tools, please send me an email and thank you for your attention. Super, thank you, Alessio, that's fantastic. Um, so his email is there if you've got any questions or just pop any questions you have in the chat. Um, so I think there's one in there about references for some of the articles that you've mentioned. Okay. So really fascinating presentation, yeah, thank you so me. much. So if you can stop sharing now, that'd be yeah. great. All right, so um, thank you very much. Great presentation. So uh, we're going to move on now to our next speaker, who's Kate de Selencourt. Um, and Kate's looking at indoor, internal air quality and issues around ventilation, whether that be natural and or mechanical ventilation. So over to you, Kate. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. And there we go. Is that working? That's working fine. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Right. Well, I'm Kate Selencourt. I'm a, a journalist um, and researcher, and I've been interested in health in buildings for quite a few years now. Um, and in particular, um, to do with uh, indoor air quality and the impacts that has on our health um, and how you can get good indoor air quality. So you'll bear with me for a second while I work out whether my clicker works. It does, jolly good. Okay, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll come on to that lovely picture later. So, right, um, poor indoor air quality and what it does to your uh, body. But that's not for you to read. That's because there's a lot, it does a lot of, horrible things. Um, this is a kind of summary. Um, unsurprisingly, poor indoor air quality affects our respiratory system, but also it affects our heart and circulation because when there's a strain on our lungs in particular, that um, makes things difficult for the heart and, and circulation too. Um, allergy in particular, um, asthma and eczema, but also um, you can get uh, a, high, a higher rate of infections if the moisture level um, is wrong inside a house either, either way it's extreme and not a comfortable middle um, cancer and reproductive disorders are associated particularly with um, the sort of chemical pollutants as opposed to um, just moisture so um, uh, things that kind of you can get you can uh, absorb through your lungs as well as through your skin and uh, as well as eating them but obviously we're interested particularly in what we breathe in um, and also uh, mental health and well-being. Um, if your air quality is really poor um, and your house is um, a bit smelly or fusty smelling or there's mould as a result of um, too much moisture in the air, then it, it really does get people down. It's a major cause of, of, um, of mental ill health in people in poor housing. Um, this the uh, WHO actually established this quite a few years ago now and it mental health um, problems as a result of poor housing is quite an overlooked area. Actually, very cold homes can be really bad for people's mental well-being as well. And I'm sure um, you'll be wanting to make your houses all lovely and warm for people for all kinds of reasons. So how do we get the air um, healthy inside people's houses? Well, the first thing, obviously, is not to pollute them in the first place. Um, and I'll talk a bit about some of the sources that uh, um, in the gift of the designer in a minute. But obviously, whatever you do, um, there will be some pollution 
um, there's going to be moisture from that laundry, you know, there'll be perfumes and whatnot that uh, people are using. Um, so we also have to remove the polluted air and replace it with less polluted air. Um, and an important note here at the bottom, um, again, you know, relating to keeping people warm, is that if, uh, if a house is too cold, people will do their best to shut the ventilation off because um, uh, it might make them feel colder. Depends on the ventilation system you put in. But also if a house is cold, the relative humidity and therefore the dampness will also increase and that's the mould and so forth enjoys, enjoys that. So um, moisture is the big one in the UK. It's a wet country. It's not a very warm country and it's definitely a wet country. Sorry, I apologise about my webcam. I'm standing up and every time I move, I go out of focus. So I hope you're not feeling too seasick. Right, so here we are, moisture, um, inescapable. Um, of course, we produce it all the time with our daily lives. So we have to shift it out of the house. Um, and that's kind of the number one issue for ventilation to, to get enough ventilation to get the moisture out. Otherwise, this is what we get. The one on the left is not a new building. That's an old concrete building, but that is just horrific. The one on the right possibly is a new building. You do find um, little bits of mould in not so well constructed new builds, um, not infrequently, unfortunately. And it tends to be um, seen most often in houses where the ventilation isn't working very well. This is mould you can't see. This is a bit of carpet. It's actually the mould. This is mould here. These little beads of mould spores um, growing in a carpet in a lab. But this was at um, about 80% humidity uh, so again a good reason to have an insulated floor because if the floor is cold the carpet will be lower temperature and then the relative humidity will go up but um, generally you want your house warm and dry um, and perhaps you might want to not have carpet at all actually um, and if the floor is warm enough um, you don't necessarily um, need carpet you can just have to put a couple of rugs down which can go in the washing machine and there is a house mite. Sorry, I hope that's not too triggering for people. A house dust mite, which eats bits of dead skin, poos it out, that gets up in the air, gets into people's lungs and gives them asthma attacks. And they also like a nice moist environment. So this is quite old research, but it's um, absolutely still stands. You can see if it's, this is the sort of happy medium. This is humidity of 70, 80, 90%. And you see some bacteria and viruses really like it. Fungi love it, mites adore it. Um, and as a result, you get um, infections and um, all kinds of horrible problems. Um, also things like formaldehyde are given off more in, um, when in damp conditions. But if it's too dry, then also the viruses like it. This little bastard, excuse my French, likes um, a nice dry atmosphere um, and also it uh, dries out your respiratory tract and so you're more likely to get an infection so you really want to go for that grey patch in the middle. Now there are other things that people have in their homes, this is my daughter's dressing table when she was a teenager, lovely, um, not much you can do about that so you have to ventilate your homes because people will bring those sorts of pollutants in. This is something hopefully that is in your gift. This adorable child is sitting on a vinyl floor um, absorbing phthalates and all sorts um, uh, which uh, could deprive that woman of grandchildren in a worst case scenario um, but um, anyway it's, it's not great for kids um, or in any of us indeed vinyl gives off all sorts of nasties and the ASBP will give you some info on that if you want to know more use nice wood oh dear actually that's vinyl as well um just put that in as a wind up um but yeah nice natural nice natural floors please um and warm ones okay uh gas burning in the house we're not in the iron age anymore we don't need to do this um it gives off carbon monoxide nitrogen dioxide all sorts of uh, vile things bye get yourself a nice um you'll get your household as a nice electric cooker instead okay outdoor pollutants um obviously you're going to be thinking about putting in vegetation to uh, get the outdoor pollution down but you probably won't eliminate it all 
um, there will be traffic and um, heaven forfend there be any chimneys in your new development, but the old ones might have them. You can keep outdoor air pollution out with uh, a good airtight fabric, um, but obviously you still need to bring air in. These are in a very poor condition, but that shows the kind of things that a filter in a ventilation system might pick up. So with the, with the right filtered ventilation and an airtight fabric, you can keep out quite a bit, not all, but quite a bit of the outdoor pollution. Now, um, I think I'm talking till 10 past, aren't I? Um, so uh, there is kind of, in my mind, sim to simplify it, two sorts of uh, ventilation. There's the sorts of ventilation at the top there, which are, traditionally well traditionally uh, generally put into new new developments where there isn't a really high priority on energy performance um and these are what you might call um cold air systems they have extract fans either the intermittent sort that comes on when you turn the bathroom light on or the uh, cooker hood um or continuous but they're just drawing air out the damp areas and the um, fresh air is coming in through these vents which could which would classically be on the uh, window frame or possibly in, in the wall and as you can see here not everybody likes having these vents open um, so that one's been closed off um, uh, because of the cold draft and this is a, a huge problem actually with these cold air systems is that when you know they'd be working properly when they're installed, which they, they often aren't installed properly, but even if they are, um, people shut them down. Um, so there you go. This is this is they're not even installed properly. Uh, only a small percent of these ones that were measured for the government um, of these cold air systems um, were actually as powerful as they are meant to be. Some of them less than half of what they're supposed to be doing. So that's a bit depressing. And then people close them anyway. This is another one pale green bars, what it should have been, the dark green bars, what it was. So this means you end up with twice as much carbon dioxide as you're recommended to have and higher humidity. And if you remember that graph um, I showed you earlier, that means they're all over to the right there where the mold and mites and so forth are flourishing. Now the alternative is an MVHR and um, Sarah talked a bit about this last night. Uh, so you've got a supply of warm air coming in um, and it's going through the, through a filter, through the heat exchanger um, and into the bedrooms and the living areas. And it's balanced by the damp, smelly air from the bathrooms and the kitchen and so forth. And the two pass each other across a, a um, heat exchanger. So the heat goes into the fresh air, but the the dirt and moisture uh, go out of the door out of the vent rather and this is just to show you what one looks like in case you've not seen one it's in this cupboard here this is the unit this is for a flat new, it hasn't been moved into yet so it's still um, just about built this is the actual unit and here you've got the duct this is one of them is going up into the ceiling to carry the fresh air to the bedroom or draw the manky air from the bathroom I don't know which and some of them would be going out through the wall um, to either fetch in fresh air or expel um, damp air. Two minutes Kate please. Thanks Simon okay so that's MVHR which um, in my opinion is greatly superior. Now we'll talk a little bit about Passive House which gives you um, quality assurance so what you've got here is people putting in MVHR the orange ones because they knew it would give them a better SAP score, but not using the quality control, which comes with Passive House, which means the design has to be approved and then the actual installation is tested. Each one is measured with an anemometer and made sure it's quiet and so forth. And the blue ones are over on the left-hand side, the Passive House ones, yes, they did almost all what they were meant to. The orange ones, a lot of them are not working properly. So that's what Passive House brings. Uh, that I will just skip on to how um, then you see Passive House is giving you, that's those blue bars are um, 
are that grey patch between 40 and 60. This is a little passive house in Lancashire and it was comfortably at 20 degrees uh, most of the time and the in the um, air quality, the humidity was between um, 40 and 60 pretty much all the time. Uh, so this one, again, we knew not to get too dry for coronavirus, but we do want to uh, get rid of people's breathed out air and breathed out viruses. And again, with passive house. Um, so quality assured MVHR, you've got lower carbon dioxide, which means lower other people's viruses. And just one last point um, with um, overheating, which is is really environmental quality rather than air quality. Um, this is really where natural ventilation comes into its own, I'd say, um, because um, you can throw open all the windows um, and Passive House, for example, um, is uh, insists that you have opening windows in every room exactly so you can do this. I mean, every house should, but you have to be able to open them properly. Those are sliding sashes, which you probably wouldn't get in a really high performance window. But nonetheless, you can specify and look carefully at how far the windows really open and not just a little chink, which then doesn't let enough air through. So that's a really important role of ventilation. Um, and, but this is a nice little bonus. This is my house, um, just to finish off with really. Um, and uh, this is on a hot day. I've got MVHR in my house. Now, what you've got here is the supply air, which is the blue line. We've got this, we've got it coming in through the ventilation system, but not past the heat exchanger. So we've got lovely cool air coming in early in the morning. And as the day warms up, this is the outside temperature, the um, uh, um, so, sorry, that's the outside temperature, the green one. So it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. When it gets to 23, we think, oh, it's getting a bit warm. So we then turn the heat recovery back on. And so our air is coming in as cool as it, you know, the house stays cool while it, the heat outside um, rises. So that's a nice little bonus you get with MVHR. So that I think was my last slide. And um, just to say, yes, if you've got any questions, I will answer them in the chat. So thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kate. There's a lot of ground you've covered there in, a, in an incredible... <laughs> it's a bit of a hurdle, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you were asked to cover a lot in a short amount of time. Um, so thank you. You did an excellent job. And yeah, I shall be looking at the chat now and I'll put a couple of links in as well. Brilliant. OK, yeah. Pop, pop your questions to any of the speakers in the chat. Um, so we, we really want to encourage your questions. Um, and we've got a nice segue now from uh, Kate finishing on overheating to our next speaker, who's Ju Julie Godfroy. Julie is technical manager at SIBC and she's also director of Julie Godfrey Sustainability Limited. And Julie is going to be looking at um, visual and thermal comfort and how we can get the basics right. So thanks, Julie, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Can you all hear me okay? We can, thank you, yeah. Great. Um, so yes, thanks, Kate. I actually almost put a slide on the air quality sensors in my uh, house. So you see, we overlap. Um, so I'll talk about visual and thermal comforts and how to get the basics right. And I do want to stress it's about the basics. So if you're interested in designing new homes for people, I recommend you have a look at this recent report, which is based on quite a large survey of what people want from their home. And without surprise, a very large majority of people said that they wanted their house to get the basics right. So noise, light, ventilation and temperature. Unfortunately, 39% of people felt their home currently does not do that. So it sounds pretty basic to design for comfort, but unfortunately it's not the case in a large proportion of homes now. And what are we talking about if we want to achieve these basics really? Elevations and fabric performance, layout and ventilation. None of that um, is particularly new. I'm sure you've covered a lot of these topics in the last few days, but what I'm going to try to do today is talk about them together. And often that is the challenge because 
These design elements are linked and their impacts on noise, light, ventilation and temperature are linked. And the challenge is often to consider them all in the round. And really one thing I want you to remember is that when we talk about fabric performance, the benefits are not only for energy performance. It's quite reductive to only think about, say, energy saving when we talk about very good insulation or very good windows. So this is uh, on the left hand side, thermal imaging of my house before and after I installed secondary glazing. And as you can see, it performs thermally much better, but the trigger for me and the benefits really are noise because I live on a busy road uh, and I will get the door changed on Friday as it happens. The other example that I often use is Passive House. That was designed as a comfort standard, not an energy use standard. And very often you hear about people feeling extremely comfortable in the summer. There are no drafts. They can sit by the window without radiative effects. So don't forget these links and don't only look at one aspect, particularly when you talk about fabric. The main challenge that you probably need to remember um, for comfort in modern homes is overheating. We know that the occurrence of overheating homes is increasing and it's not only about climate change. So you can't only look at beneficial winter solar gains, you have to consider summer gains as well. What we often hear um, is um, people complaining that by wanting very good insulation and air tightness, we have created an overheating risk. That is not true, it's very reductive. Insulation and air tightness are only a small part of the story. And there's a multitude of factors that result in overheating when you look at homes that experience it. Site context, the glazed areas, as well as shading, the ventilation, and these are the factors we will talk about today. So don't worry that if you have high fabric performance thermally, you will be creating an overheating risk. It doesn't have to be the case. Similarly, you can design both for visual and thermal comfort. And that means you have to consider it quite early and strategically, but also throughout in the detail. So this um, is what I'll cover mostly today. And for this, I'll use um, a tool and guidance that I created with Susie Diamond, which is available for free from the Good Homes Alliance. It was specifically designed to help people at the early design stages of homes and it's for non-specialist so please play with it there's a one page very simple tool and more guidance if you want and i'll take you through some of it today to show you how it works and what you can learn from it it's pretty simple how it works on the left hand side you have factors that contribute to overheating risk and in particular heat gains and it balances this out with factors that help dissipate heat or limit heat gains, for example, shading, ventilation, and some side factors. You add up the risk factors, you add up the mitigating factors, and you get a simple score that gives you an idea of whether you are high, medium, or low risk of overheating. And that also tells you where to look at, for example, do you have too much glazing? The main things really, the largest risk and mitigation factors are the site characteristics that may prevent window openings or people opening their windows wanting to. Solar gains uh, from glazing, particularly those exposed to um, southeast to southwest. The aspects of the apartments or homes, which Kate told you a little about, and glazing potential. That's what we'll talk most about today. So what are you going to do first when you start designing your building for energy performance, thermal comfort, views, etc.? You are not going to design the facade first. This is not where you should start. You should look at your site. 
Um, so obviously you have to consider its potential in terms of passive design for winter gains and summer gains, but also all sorts of contextual information on air quality, on noise, on views that you might want to favor, location near greenery, which is pleasant and cools down the local air a little. So please don't, do not underestimate this step because if you do, you're quite likely later on to end up with issues, which means that you need to redesign or you need to rely on complex, expensive mechanical solutions. So spend quite a lot of time understanding your site and thinking about where you want to put the buildings, how you might protect, um, protect them from exposure to noise and air quality, how you might within a building lay out the routes. So classically, you wouldn't want bedrooms on the road side of a building block. If you also have the capacity for a mixed use site, you probably want the commercial elements on the most noisy side side of the site, etc. And that really, I insist on this first step, because very often we see homes that essentially don't have a chance of being healthy and comfortable for occupants due to very early decisions on where they were put and where the bedrooms were put. So apartments like this that are single aspect with their elevations onto a noisy polluted road, occupants don't have a chance of being healthy. They will be exposed to noise, pollution, and sometimes altogether overheating. I won't talk more about noise. It's covered in the Good Homes Alliance tool, but I know Jack Harry Clark after me will tell you more about it. Um, so please, please consider your site. And <clears throat> As you start putting the blocks onto your site, try to maximize the number of homes and ideally all homes that have dual aspect. So exposure on both ends, that will have multiple benefits. It means that your solar gains won't happen all at the same time. They will be spaced out throughout the day. So you won't have these three or four hours that potentially are very uncomfortable. It obviously maximizes cross ventilation potential. And more generally, it's very pleasant for occupants because you get different types of lights throughout the day. So that's a very early and important decision that will really help you quite a lot later on to minimize reliance on mechanical systems. You can also now start thinking about the facade and roughly speaking, what sort of proportion of glazings you are looking at. And no doubt, once you start talking about more than 50% of the facade being glazed, you are significantly increasing the risk of overheating wherever you are in the country. It's more true in the Southeast, but it is true still throughout the country. Um, these apartments that are unshaded and highly glazed, again, don't stand a chance of being comfortable for much of the year. And obviously that balances out with shading. It used to be seen as continental, but you probably have noticed more and more on new build that it's more common now to see glazing. And there's all sorts of ways to do that through facade articulation, through balconies, movable shading devices are more and more common. I recommend them wherever you can because it means that you can maximize winter gains, but protect yourself against the summer gains and people can use it for other things, privacy, glare, anything that they want. They can close them when they're away, but still open the windows potentially. So that movable shading devices are really um, the best if people find them easy to work. And um, that also takes me to the next thing, and that is very often, unfortunately, forgotten, is what matters for visual comfort is not only the amount of glazing, it's where it is and what shape. So 
narrow vertical glazing or glazing in a corner of the room is not going to have the same benefits for daylight as a um, higher up wider window. So the same area of glazing doesn't lead to the same daylight penetration. And the higher the window, the better. Obviously, you don't want it all too high because you want views, but lower um, areas are not beneficial for daylight. They also lead to other issues. As you can see, very often people feel quite exposed when there's lower glazing. So they very often close the curtains, which is not great for daylight and which is not great for ventilation. For security reasons, the low areas are typically um, not openable. So again, for the same area of glazing, you get less ventilation. Very often they are restricted as well. So altogether, you have an area of glazing that is not giving you as much as it could and as much as it should perform for the occupants. So don't forget that the facade is not only to be designed from the outside and how it looks, but how it will be lived in from the inside for its function, visually, thermally, for ventilation, etc. Designed from the inside. You can still make it look good. This will deal with a lot of the issues, but obviously I'm only covering the big items here. And in order to ensure good visual and thermal comfort, you also need to look at the detail. So we've mentioned some of this. So your opening devices and how they interact with shading, with curtains or with external shading, um, but also safety and security. Don't underestimate this. Often at the design stage, we make some assumptions about a window being having a particular opening area and free area, but then restrictors start coming in for security or people feel uncomfortable, so they, um, they feel insecure, so they actually don't open it. That often happens on the ground floor or in areas that are say very urban or sites where people for a reason or another do not feel really secure. So that's another consideration in your site analysis, but also at the designs, at the detailed design stage to make sure that you have your windows, they've been well designed, but they're also likely to be used. Ground floors are really the key here, but not only. And um, Another thing, th thing I thought I would quickly cover, particularly in the context today of timber construction, is whether thermal mass is a good thing. Now, I'm sure you know how roughly thermal mass works. So essentially, it accumulates things like stone, concrete, accumulate heat during the day, and they release it at night. That only works if you have a means to cool that mass at night. So typically it's with nighttime cooling through ventilation. So opening, for example, windows and at high level. And that's been proven to work quite well in non-domestic buildings, which are empty at night and you have some ways to securely open uh, the windows or vents, etc. It's also obviously uh, well known to work in say Mediterranean climates, typically in rural situations. However, uh, the evidence of how it works in other contexts, for example, urban situations where it's a bit noisy at night and where potentially because of the urban heat island effect, the temperature doesn't drop that much that evidence is much more mixed. And there are reasons to think that potentially it's not that much of a good thing because to have accumulated all that heat, because unless you could, you can easily dissipate it, the heat will be released in the home where people are trying to sleep. So it's a much more nuanced situation than just saying thermal mass is good and I want a thermally massive building and it's much more nuanced. You, I wouldn't say you necessarily have to worry if you build in timber because what it a lightweight building will also mean is sure it may 
I could heat up quicker, but it would also cool down quicker. So always think about the balance of heat gains and heat dissipation that has to be thought about in the round. Two minutes, Julie, thank you. Here we go, I sped up a bit. How about that, that is superb. So here we go, don't hesitate uh, to send me questions and I'll stay a little bit um, for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, that's excellent. And um, we're ahead of time, so that's a small miracle. Um, so yeah, please everybody keep um, your questions coming. Please put them in the chat and give our speakers um, some work, get them typing away. Um, it's always good to see my colleagues working away. And um, so um, thank you so much, Julie, for an extra ex excellent uh, runaround visual and thermal comfort. Uh, so two key issues of uh, environmental quality. So um, we're going to move on now to um, Jack Harvey Clark. So Jack is speaking actually at our expo next week on the 24th. Um, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to um, to see him then and now. So Jack is a managing director of, of Apex Acoustics and Acoustics. And so the title of the presentation, it's all noise or is it? And design essentials. So over to you, Jack. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, and I, yeah, I didn't actually read the title of the talk, so I didn't <laughs> influence what I, <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, I'll make sure, and can I start sharing my screen? No, somebody, I think you need to stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. If you can stop sharing, Julie, then we can hand over to Jack. So... That's weird because I stopped sharing straight away. It doesn't okay. show that I'm sharing anymore. All right, thank you. So Jack, you... In principle, oh, yeah, no, go, yeah, yeah, I've got it now. It takes a moment right, doesn't it, to, to work its way through. So, oh, yeah, no, no, no I was pressing the wrong button actually. <laughs> so, driver error, really. <laughs> yeah, okay. hold my hands up. Okay, so, uh, usually, of course, when I'm presenting, the sound doesn't work. That's the classic thing. <laughs> Excellent. At least you can hear me today. So. We can, thank you very much. All right, Jack, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to be talking about acoustics, uh, why sound is important to us and how we can use that information to design the built environment to be more suitable sonically, because I think often sound is underrated um, and in terms of its importance of our experience. How do we take sound into account in the master planning, as we heard about earlier, um, and in that uh, in terms of the internal environment in buildings, as Julie was talking about, it is not simple at all. So I'll try and explain some of these things. The little bit where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, right, Apex Acoustics, yes. At the end of this month, it'll be 15 years since I set it up by myself. I've Previous experience was um, designing power stations and other things like that. Um, I used to work at Parsons in the Northeast. Uh, that was a while ago before that. We've grown to become one of the largest independent acoustic consultancies in the UK with 21 of us. We work um, across the country out of three offices. We used to be three offices, now it's 24 offices. Um, and we often win awards for our work. Uh, we like to dig a bit deeper and find out what's important, uh, go beyond the standards, and we make lots of contributions to standards and guidance in the industry. So <clears throat> why should we care about um, acoustics in the built environment? And I think another way of phrasing that is, um, why do we hear and what's our hearing for in the first place? When you see this picture, obviously that young impala the, near there is about to get, about to get eaten. But look at the size of its ears. They are part of its early warning system. So sound, we evolved the use of sound as part of our early warning system. So sound is meant to it's deeply wired into our brains to alert us to what's going on. Our brains are fantastically good looking at patterns in the sounds that we hear. 
course, these days, the most important or the most significant use of sound is for communication. Um, and it's what sound means uh, to us that mostly affects how we feel about it. It's not just about sound level decibels at all, but that's the most common measure that we have. Uh, so that's mostly what we've got to deal with. We know that excessive noise is detrimental to our health. And this is a graph showing a typical sleep cycle. And all those deep stages of sleep there get um, interrupted or interfered with if noises happen, if there's too much noise in general, or if there's uh, a noise event. And that might change the stage of sleep that you're in, even without waking you up. So you might not realize that noise has affected your sleep in the morning. The biggest impacts of noise on people are annoyance and sleep disturbance. There are other health impacts because even when we become accustomed to noises or habituated to the sound of the train passing, for example, or the um, constant traffic, it still, noise still increases our heart rate. So it's an increased risk of all the cardiovascular diseases. Control is always very important when we think about noise. Uh, one definition of noise is sound that the recipient doesn't want to hear. So that implies a lack of control in the first place. How big is this, this problem then from environmental noise? So the World Health Organization did a big study published in 2011. And at a very conservative estimate, they reckoned more than a million healthy life years were lost every year across the European region uh, due to noise. And it's the second biggest cause of um, environmental disease after air pollution. Most people don't realize that. World Health Organization produced some guidelines in 2018. Uh, what should we do about the impact of noise? And they suggested these numbers that we should try and reduce people's exposure below 53 dB L den. So den is day, evening, and night. It's like a combined noise level. Uh, so can we do that? Well, it turns out that more than 80% of people in the UK are actually exposed to higher levels of noise than that. So that's almost all of us being potentially adversely affected by noise. If you look at your site, um, then noise maps are available on the internet at that address at the bottom there. Um, this is the way the LDEN looks over the site. So we can see here's the key here. To, Below 55, it's just not plotted. It only goes down to 55, if you like. So if this and this road looks like it's going to be remodeled in the master plan, but if you have the same amount of traffic on it, then basically the whole of the site is going to be above this threshold um, of 53 dB. The World Health Organization suggested we should be reducing noise levels below. Not a lot you can do about that, I shouldn't think. Um, but as Julie said, I mean having the in terms of the master plans, having some noise barriers along this road, or which could be non-residential use buildings, they're the best noise barriers. Um, they might want some green infrastructure with them too. Um, green walls, of course. Um, that's the best thing you can do to reduce the noise um, affecting the site. If we dig a little deeper and see where that data comes from. Um, this is the um, scatter plot and regression. So on this axis, we have noise level. And you can see at 53 dBL then, that each of these different uh, markers is from a different study, a different place. So between studies, there's even um, a huge range in levels of people. Percent HA is highly annoyed. So this is how annoyed people are by the noise. And this is the noise level up here. There's a huge range of responses for a given noise level. Obviously, within a study, there's going to be an even greater diversity of uh, ranges of responses. So noise level is not the only thing, but it is an important thing that we should consider. How do we design holistically for uh, these four aspects of internal environmental quality? As Julie was talking about just now, the uh, thermal and um, visual aspects of that. How do we add in acoustic considerations? And let's start with what happens at the minute, because 
we did a review a few years ago of planning applications in London that had both overheating assessments and noise assessments done for them um, to reveal, to put in numbers, what we knew was happening in the industry. So these applications, uh, because they were for large developments, had to have both these types of assessments. And so we looked at 180 planning applications. And in those, 85% uh, of them made the assumption in the overheating assessment that the windows were open. So the occupants could open their windows for their thermal comfort. But in the noise assessment, they assumed that the windows were closed for their acoustic comfort. Obviously incompatible um, assumptions for the occupants. I think it's an embarrassing state of the industry when it does things like that. Uh, and this was all part of developing information on how to consider all these things together, which we produced in the Acoustics Ventilation Overheating Residential Design Guide. This is aimed at acousticians rather than um, non-acousticians, uh, but it gives some criteria for designing for environmental noise and ventilation for air quality and separate criteria for environmental noise when designing for mitigating overheating. So if you are using opening windows, there's some relaxation to the noise level that are uh, suggested. Otherwise, it just wouldn't be practical. We'd be suggesting that you can't use opening windows in most places that people actually live at the minute, uh, which is not a possible way to go forward. There's also criteria in there for mechanical ventilation uh, noise, because that's, excuse me, not quite covered in the building regulations, perhaps surprisingly again. But one of the most common reasons people turn their ventilation systems off is because they're too noisy. I'm sure you've all got experience of noisy ventilation systems that you've turned off. Uh, if your house is airtight, as modern houses need to be, to be thermally efficient, then obviously it's essential that the ventilation system works if you're going to have a good indoor air quality. So what's just happened uh, just a few weeks ago is a new consultation on a new part of the building regulations to address overheating through document X. And this includes um, a section on ensuring the overheating strategy is usable. Excuse me, one of those aspects is the noise. So this just addresses, this consultation document just addresses noise uh, during the night time in the overheating assessment. So it's taking the first bite, if you like, at the problem. Uh, people have more control in the daytime because you can open or close the window depending on what you're doing. So you can balance your thermal comfort with your acoustic comfort. With your activity. Obviously in the nighttime you can't do that. You don't want to have to get up to open or close the window in the nighttime. But it suggests 40 dB um, average over the nighttime period. Uh, so let's look at our site again. And this time this is the nighttime noise levels at the site. So again plots down to 50 dB. This is outside. Now a conservative estimate with the amount of window opening you're likely to need um, to mitigate overheating is 10 dB. The outside level to the inside level uh, might could easily be less than that, depending on the design. So everywhere where it's more than 50 dB outside, um, that means that it would not be suitable to be relying on opening windows during the nighttime period to mitigate overheating. So there's another consideration for you. Does your overheating strategy work without relying on opening the windows at night time. So if you have a mechanical ventilation system, does it supply enough ventilation to uh, mitigate overheating during the night, for example, or do you need to use a different strategy? So that's all I'm going to say about environmental noise, and I'm going to rush on to talking about the internal design of the building, <clears throat> the sound insulation performance. So there's building regulations for sound insulation between attached dwellings and within attached dwellings. So approved document E contains the uh, requirements for sound. There's requirements um, E1 and E2 are relevant to um, attached dwellings. E1 describes the requirements, the sound insulation. Actually, I'll do that in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the requirements between dwellings have to be tested. So you have to sound test 10% of your dwellings after you finish building them. House builders don't like having a 
sound test at the end when they've already sold their building, somebody's about to move in. So there's an alternative scheme, which is to use robust details. And if you use these details and adhere to them exactly the way they're drawn in the book, uh, then you don't have to carry out sound testing at the end. So they achieve compliance by over-designing slightly, um, by 5 dB on average, um, at the minimum. And, and they're very prescriptive. Um, they should be relatively straightforward to build, and you should get the performance that it does. That means you're going to get a bit better performance if you use these details. That means you've got a pattern book there. Um, so I think it might be 500 pages now or so long of different types of details and all the junction details with all the um, associated elements, and how to build them. There's, it's very useful information, even if you're not registering your buildings with robust detail. I think these are used in about 70% of new attached dwellings. So normal um, in the industry to use them. Neither of those things tell you about how good it might, people might want the sound insulation performance to be. So this European collaboration produced a classification system for acoustics. So there's six classes from A to E um, that are described like this. The class A being the highest and F being the lowest. So our building regulations are around about class D or E as a minimum legal performance. Um, which is what the building regulations are. But you might want to do better than that. People might want to enjoy better conditions than that. The requirement E1 between dwellings applies. So this is, imagine this is a schematic um, section, if you like, through your building. So I think because you're, what you need to design is just attached houses. You don't have any separating floors. You just have a separating wall to think about for the adjoining house. So that's just the airborne sound insulation. You don't have to think about the impact sound insulation that would apply if there were um, other dwellings above or below, so flats, for example. Requirement E2 is of only very marginal importance, really. It uh, applies within dwellings and it applies to rooms that um, are a bedroom or a room containing a water closet, i.e. a toilet. Uh, it doesn't apply to walls that contain doors. So you often end up finding that there's not very many walls that it applies to, and it's a very low standard anyway. It does also apply to internal floors. So think about sound insulation design. It's good to remind ourselves just briefly what sound is. Uh, essentially, we've got some nice pictures, hopefully nice. Um, but this is a single sound wave, if you like. So sound in air is a longitudinal wave which means the vibration is in the same direction that the wave travels. So it is, sound is just vibration in the air and the vibration is picked up in our ears and uh, interpreted by the nerves in our brains into sound. In solid materials, that's the vibration, it requires the vibration of a solid material. So here's a 2D flat plate, if you, if you like, in its fundamental mode of vibration. We can look at higher modes of vibration. These are all superposed in practice, and so on and so on and so on, so that physical things have to physically um, vibrate. The solid materials have to vibrate physically to transmit the sound from one room to another. When we think about sound transmission between rooms, we think about the direct sound, the sound that goes through the separating partition between the two rooms. That's not the only route that the sound will take. But even actually said so to get through a partition, the vibration in the air has to vibrate the partition, which then vibrates, transmits the vibration um, into the air on the other side. So this um, acts, if you like, like a, um, this is the loudspeaker in the receiving room when this, this surface vibrates. Because air, if you think of this as a solid concrete, for example, wall, um, air is very light, if you like. So vibrating air doesn't vibrate heavy things very easily. But that's how they insulate against sound. By so every time the vibration changes from one medium to another, there's a reduction in the amount of vibration that's transmitted. As well as the direct path, there are the flanking path. So this 
is one that we'll be thinking about today. So the air in the room vibrates the element that goes past the direct um, separating partition. And then this vibrates in the receiving room. And so this vibrating surface transmits sound into the receiving room there. We'll bear that in mind uh, in a little bit. If you think about building in traditional timber frame, there's great details and robust details. There's four um, timber frame walls. So the references are like this E because it's part E, WT wall timber. And I've pulled out number two here that's shown with sheathing board. So EWT1 is just the same, but without the sheathing board, we usually see that this is for structural reasons. Um, this is usually um, needed in the design. So it's composed of twin frames, so separate frame wall. Uh, it's about 300 millimetres overall profile, and you need to have more than 22 kilograms per square metre of plaster on both sides. So that means, for example, two layers of 15 mil sound block, um, or two different boards that would add up to that weight. That. And you need mineral wool in the cavities and between the panels. The mineral wool in the cavity um, literally absorbs as the, as the air resonates in those cavities, those air particles move a little bit with the vibration and its friction between the movement of air and all those fibers that absorbs the energy from the sound. That's what the quilt is doing for you. So in robust details, they have all, all the junction details you want in there. So this is one that might be relevant to you, for example, which is the an internal floor uh, where it meets the party wall. And you can see there will be ties um, across here at uh, usually at every story level, but there's, they're the only connections between the wall on this side and the wall on this side. Obviously this, well, this was drawn before the current part L requirements. So you'd now need to fully fill the cavity with which is the problem with the stick mode. And this just so happens to get about 10 dB better than the building regs minimum performance requirements. This is this performs fantastically in terms of sound insulation. It, you would typically achieve about the class B in the classification system, which is a very high standard. So you wouldn't want to, there'll be no need to improve on that at all. Um, we we'll come to internal walls. Um, to meet the E2 requirements, so this is walls around the bedroom or a toilet, and the walls that don't have a door in, you need to put a quilt in there um, to meet that. A quick look at um, CLT, party wall details. Now CLT might be single leaf, or it could be twin leaf um, in terms of the CLT element. And if we think about the twin leaf one, first of all, um, how are we going to do the junction detail? So this is imagining a um, wall, and a, so the party wall and an internal floor. Now if we build, if this was built being a continuous member like this, we're going to get that flanking sound problem. So you'd get more sound coming through here than you would through the wall. And this might be enough sound to fail the building regulations requirement. So what we need to do is introduce a break. We can do this in a twin leaf wall and build it like that. That effectively overcomes the flanking sound problem. This would probably get about 5 dB better than building regs. It's not quite as good as the traditional timber frame uh, design, but it's still very robust acoustically. I've shown this one with, one with plasterboard directly on the CLT, but you might have battens uh, for a service zone in there. If you build, if you try and try and build this with a single leaf wall, this the wall itself can be plenty good enough, but the difficulty is this junction detail and the flanking sound. So this is possible, I believe. Um, you can't actually build your internal floors um, without a ceiling um, or floating floor, just because the performance of its that element itself is not good enough to meet the internal requirements. Um, but, uh, the requirement E2 in the building regs. This is not quite as good as the other, um, as a twin leaf um, CLP design, but obviously it's a lot more economical in terms of materials used. An internal wall as well in CLT can't just be a CLT panel, it would need bands with quilt and a plasterboard lining on. Let's have a listen to how these sound then. 
Um, so I'm going to play you um, a, let's say your neighbour is listening to the news. Um, this is quite loud because I've had to make this as loud as possible so you, that you can hear it on the other side of a wall. So this is so just to warn you, so it is loud. Coming up at 10.30, it's sports day. Then at 10.40, the papers will discuss the stories on tomorrow's front pages. If your neighbour is listening like that, um, and you're sitting quietly in your living room or bedroom and you've got a single leaf CLP wall. So I don't know if you can hear that or not, depends how you're listening. You can't really do listening experiments over Zoom like this because who knows what Zoom does to the sound. It's far too sophisticated. Uh, but this one should be slightly higher sound insulation. So let's have a listen to this, see if you can hear this. And the twin timber stud. I don't know if you could hear those or not, but there's. Um, <clears throat> so what we need to think about in terms of environmental noise are, is reducing the exposure of the dwellings and particularly the bedrooms, as Julie mentioned as well. Um, taking a holistic approach to thinking about noise and the overheating mitigation strategy. And for the sound insulation design, the details will follow the structural approach that you adopt. Beware of flanking sound. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Fantastic. Really interesting presentation. And um, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, so please put your questions to Jack into the chat and um, we'll try and have a look at those. Um, so uh, we're nearly out of time. It's been a fantastic um, evening. So thanks to all of our speakers and thanks to Tabitha for uh, her excellent organising and hosting. So I'm going to hand you back to Tabitha to finish up and close up and I'll hang out for a few minutes afterwards to um, answer, uh, answer any questions and to, to catch up with you all then. So thank you. Over to you, Tabitha. Thank you, Simon. Well, whoa, what an evening. I learned so much. This is where construction is so skilled. We need to work together and we need to understand it. And all our speakers hadn't interacted and yet they passed the baton from one to the other like they all knew what the person before them was going to be talking about. Uh, but this is where the, the uh, why working together with professionals who know their stuff is so important. So Simon, thank you, Paula, Ed, Jamie, Alessio, Kate, Julie and Jack so 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 good and um, because it's recorded we can get this to a much much wider audience now we couldn't bring this to you without sponsorship so i'd like to thank our sponsors the confederation of timber industries akoya rothoblas so what jack was just speaking about they do um sound attenuation um, um fixtures and fittings timber decking and cladding association PEFC, the ASBP, Wood for Good, and BSW Timber. And tomorrow night, like you haven't had enough this week, we look at the timber challenges. Um, led by Christiane Lelake, we have the Structural Timber Association, um, Robin Lancashire from BM Trada and Martin Milner, also representing the Structural Timber Association. And we will be looking at fire and moisture, two of the most important things you need to consider when you're specifying timber. Obviously, along with all the other things you heard tonight and in the previous series. And then on Friday, you won't have enough of us, so you'll come and want to hang out in the virtual pub. And that's where we just get together and have a chat, talk over the week and form teams um, to take part in the competition. So I'd like to say thank you for this evening. That was health and well-being. Tomorrow it's timber challenges and um, I went too far again. <laughs>